The first speaker this morning is uh, Mr. Greg Lee, former president of the Kentucky Hemp Growers Association. Uh, as you see on his bio, uh, Mr. Lee has extensive experience with uh, industrial hemp. And the title of his presentation is Industry Overview by Industrial Hemp. And we have to say him for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia State University, for having me here and speak to this fine gem, this fine group of people. You know, uh, my uh, uh, bio is uh, a long one. You know, I started industrial hemp in 1993 because the University of Kentucky got a uh, grant from the uh, uh, Kellogg Foundation to look into Integrated Fibers Working Group, and one of them was uh, uh, Knauf and hemp, and so my little group, uh, my county, took over the uh, issue of Knauf versus hemp, and so I jumped on the hemp bandwagon because it was native to, to Kentucky, and our history goes so deep in it, just like Virginia's history goes as well. You know, so over the years, over the years, my, what we did as a group for the Kentucky Hemp Growers Cooperative, which the Kentucky Hemp Growers Cooperative was formed in 1941 by a group of family that said that they needed the seed for the next year. That family was the Graves family out of Lexington, Kentucky, that was uh, the federal agents come to their uh, cooperative and took the seed under the Hemp for Victory program to be able to grow seed for the, uh, for the uh, war effort in uh, World War II. So what we did in fast forward, 1994-95, we went to the Secretary of State's office and we reincorporated every corporation that was ever formed in the state of Kentucky that had no family name. That way it would give us credibility in our corporations. And the corporation that I was a, a, a officer of was Madison Hemp and Flax Company, incorporated in 1806 by Henry Clay. So that gave us some prestige of what we did. And so uh, this is where we started working at. We formed the Hemp Fed Beef Company, it was uh, an antibiotic steroid hormone free come later and we got we had a national trademark for that and the United States Department of Agriculture they wouldn't be in the line for antibiotic steroid hormone free but they didn't care if we fed the animals hemp seed meal and that's the meal after the oils have been extracted so these are the things that we were setting markets up for and one of them at Kentucky State University which I had the pleasure of working with these fine people uh, we were sitting one day in a gentleman's shop. We was talking about, what can we use hemp for? Well, let's just try it. So we had some hemp seed meal there, and there's an a, a aquarium there. And I just dropped the, some of the meal over into the aquarium. Well, the fish just went right after it. They smelt up and everything, picked it up, watered it around their mouth. Next morning, I went to Kentucky State University. Without hesitation, I was down there at 8 o'clock. Why? Because Kentucky State University had an aquaculture program that we could intervene in and set up a food diet. That food diet was set up uh, and they tried it with channel catfish to see if the catfish would eat it. They made a, they made a study of it. The studies laying out here on this plot. I think it's on the internet as well. So that's a three, at that time it was two to a three billion dollar industry just in aquaculture alone in the United States. And the crop's not even legal. We were getting this stuff from Canada. We were setting up Canada's markets because they were growing. Our organizations worked with the first five acres that was grown in Canada's research. So we had hemp bales that was being brought in from the from Canada to use square bales. They brought down roll bales, like a 600 pound roll bale, which had intrigued the farmers on how to harvest it. And they brought down straight stalks to give us the idea of, of, of the complexity of the stalk itself. So we had this within the seven hour drive of Lexington, Kentucky. So Kentucky State University, they seen this, they did research on it, they went to hybrid strike bass, and one of the things that they found because of the high amino acid content of the seed meal, there was about six or seven percent moisture, so that's how much oil was left in it. This day and time it's about three percent because they're taking out more oil. But in that food process, they eliminated in Aquarius study, and the study is outside. They went, uh, they took it to Washington D.C. It's been set up there 
and uh, it was to replace fish meal. And fish meal in the aquaculture industry, they take it from the small fish fry, about like this from the ocean. And the ocean is being depleted from these small fish. And they, they, they blend it. Well, when you feed this to your aquaculture, then the fecal material is laden with heavy mercury because there's more higher con concentration of mercury in the small fish fry than it is the bigger fish. But the bigger fish are eaten and consumed. So once you feed this diet to the fish, it goes in there and you start the mercury content. You start to poison your own pond that you're raising the fish. So this is a big deal that hemp was to replace fish meal. This is, this is one. Now we're over here feeding hemp seed meal to cattle. The, two, the, the daily gain of cattle might still be around 2.99 on the daily average. And so what we did with the meal, the meal wasn't raising the cattle any different. We wasn't gaining any more weight. But there was one thing at the very end that we were finding. And that is, and I'm talking about the end, the end that we were finding because of the high amino acid content that they were utilizing more of the feed. And Dr. John Johns from the University of Kentucky, he was a, he's a number one renowned beef, beef analyst and speaker for Nebraska, Kansas. He travels all over speaking on, uh, on, on uh, cattle. He come to our farm. But at that time, hemp wasn't legal in Kentucky. It wasn't legal anywhere. And so he was coming to our farm when he was off work and looking at our cattle and giving us direction on which way to go. And Dr. Jackson from the University of Kentucky, he set up the, he set up the ration for us to feed to him. And so what we did is we fed about three ounces of meal over, we top dressed it. We top dressed it and so we had taste tests and the end result is we were compared with taste to Colby beef. Anybody knows anything about Colby beef? It was it, it breaks about eighty dollars a pack on the on the market. We were going with a beef jerky. We already had that set up and our marketing for the beef jerky was going to be in Boulder, Colorado where everybody we figured was really because of the hikers and everything else in Boulder would be a good place for the beef jerky and we had that set up. When we go to put our legend on our beef jerky, the USDA wouldn't let us use antibiotic steroid hormone free, A asterisk S asterisk H, but they didn't care if we used him. And we said, whoa, we thought it'd be the other way around. <laughs> we thought it'd be the other way around. So I argued with the guy, his name was Mark Bradley, he was uh, under Dan Blickman at that time, and I called him five times in two weeks, and he was just almost ready to tell us to go ahead and do it anyway, you know, and then wait for the lawsuit or wait for regulation to come. And that thing is, I wish we had it, because our beef jerky was going to sell at $19.50 a pound, and that means you could take those 33 roasts or chuck roasts that comes off of an animal and turn them into beef jerky. Now you've got money. Now you've got rocking and rolling. So these are some of the things that we did in marketing. Now then, that's for the seed cake. You know, we went, I've talked to seed cake here, you know, three or four different things. Now then, let's go to the stalks. What we found out in the stalks is moving them. The farmer cannot move these things no more than 50 miles and be profitable on a thousand pound roll bale. He can't do it. It's just not feasible for the farmer to do it. So the thing about it is you have to look inside the state and say, what can we do with these roll bales? What can we do with the industry? First of all, there's three things that you must consider in this without a doubt. And that's the quality of the stock, the consistency of the stock and how it can be grown, and the continuity of supply. I am not going to come to Virginia and build any business of $1.2 million or $3 million and wait on this year's crop. And I'm not going to do it for next year's crop. So you have to build up this continuity of supply. And I'm working with North Carolina, with their cooperative, that they've got for me down there. And the last time I left them, this is what they wanted to do. The farmer has got to give up something. And he's got to give it up. When you grow these crops, save the stock. The law might say get rid of the seed, you got to destroy the seed. That's sad because you can't acclimate. I was talking to uh, Dr. Wilkerson over at the Virginia Tech yesterday, and this is a problem, being able to have the seed continually so you can acclimate them to this region. If we have to kill the seed, then go back and get some more and bring them back, we're not giving them a chance to acclimate. And uh, so 
if you get these roll bales and get them in a continuity of supply, then they can be able to go into the industry. So what is the industry? If I take these roll bales, what is the industry? A lot of people say it's processing, fiber, and stuff like this. And I'm not going to mention too much about fiber. The one thing that I will mention and drive home, and this is for each and every one of you, business, farmer, and all, cellulose. Cellulose. Everything in this room is cellulose. Either it's from a hydrocarbon, which most of it is, 99% of it is, or it could be from a carbohydrate. We're being eaten up with plastics that will not biodegrade. And when you mention cellulose, you're talking about paper, you're talking about boat paddles, you're talking about computer, uh, computer casings. Anything that's made out of plastic, a boat can be made out of hemp. These uh, drones can be made out of hemp to composites. So cellulose and composites is one of them. And if you really want to get up on this, go to the Nova Institute. You need to write this down. Nova Institute in Europe. They're looking in, in I was talking to North Carolina about this about two, three weeks ago and telling composites, composites, composites. I go home and I've got an email from the Nova Institute and it's telling me they're having a composite, bio composites convention about two days in Europe. And the Europeans are looking for the United States to be a bio-based company. We need to be a country making bio-based products something that will biodegrade. And so hemp is, plays a big role. One well, the gentleman, his name was, uh, he was a scientist and he worked for Dow Corning for 18 years. And so he called us up and, and the gentleman called me up and said, I got a call from Guru. He's an Indian, he's an Indian from India. And said, he wants to talk to us about him. So we met him in Southern Indiana, had a nice dinner. We are sitting there eating and he's explaining to us what he could do. And he said, my factory, he said, can take hemp as it is. He said, I said, well, what about the processing? He said, it doesn't need to be processed. And I said, in other words, I'm a farmer and I just cut it down and take it right into your factory. He said, we'll take the moisture out of everything as it goes through the process. Well, this is a win-win for the farmer. I mean, I fell back in my chair and I made him say it three times. <laughs> but see, I, I made him say it three times. A friend of mine's taking notes. Well, sure enough, if you really look at it for the composites of plastic industry, you can take it down and take it right in, right into the factory. But you have to have that continuity of supply because I'm not going to deal with you if you don't have at least one, two, or three years. I mean, we didn't grow tobacco in Kentucky and Virginia just to be able to package tobacco from this year's crop. There has to be a supply line, and it's that way with everything. And so the quality, consistency, and continuity of supply are the three things that needs to back this up. Now then, what helps back that up? What helps back that up is strong co-ops. And I'm understanding that there's a co-op being formed here with some of the activists that's really in this. It's called, they're going to name it, South Central Sustainable Solutions Cooperative, which I thought was a real good name, an excellent name. The one down in North Carolina is Bioregion. R-E-G-E-N, short for bioregenerative cooperative. And these are the avenues where money can come to, a strong cooperative can be financed, it can be farmer-owned, and this cooperative can set up this continuity of supply with the industry. Now how do we get that? This sounds pretty, it sounds good. The universities, especially Virginia State, right here, because you're, you're out here in front, Virginia State University, works with the activist. The activist knows a lot of this stuff. So what you do is you tie the activist to the industry. They're the ombudsman to the university. They go out and do the knocking on the doors and say, hey, look here, I'm here on behalf of a cooperative. I'm not here on behalf of Craig Lee because they're not going to deal with Craig Lee. They're going to deal with a group of people or an association of people where they can feel, feel good. And then you're back to about a Virginia State University or some said university that the industry feels comfortable with. Then because of the farm bill, you know, most industries will not get on board with the hemp deal because it's on schedule one, as was mentioned by some of the legislators. So here we are, we're caught in this, so you draw the circle, you go out and you pick the excuse me, you go out and you pick the industry up and then you bring them back and say, hey industry, can you help fund some of the research? 
Well, we can't because it's on Schedule 1. Yes, you can because you can do it through a university. And this is what's being left out in some degree, is the industry can come out and give a little bit of money with matching funds through some of the, the uh, tobacco settlement money and fund research to do this to let the farmers in the cooperative to be able to grow this or outside the cooperative to do the research into this and then we get good solid information. And then we can set up markets through this. And the, the markets in the industrial hemp is out there. For example, there's a speaker that's going to be speaking later on, and I won't get much into it, but his name is Marty Phelps with Old Dominion with horse bedding. Well, horse bedding, when I found out he was involved in it, I said, whoa, we did horse bedding. I've done been a millionaire, folks. And the United States government cut us off at the border. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I was an entrepreneur. I worked with the Kellogg Foundation through the University of Kentucky to research industrial hemp. And I was put to the wayside because of rules and regulations at the border that DEA and, uh, and Customs had on, uh, had on the crops. And uh, this is a product that works. And this is an industry that can be supported to help Marty with his business already. And he's important. So why don't we set up the infrastructure to help support him as time goes on and get that continuity of supply. This is a very complex thing. And what makes it complex is the laws that surround it, the laws that govern him. Once this is taken off Schedule 1 or being able to move to the side where we can understand it and get the laws out of the way and say, hey, universities go after it, hey, uh, farmers go after it, this is a no-brainer. You know, I mean, in the 19, somebody might correct me, 1915, 1916, when the soybean came to America, if you study the history of the soybean, the farmer run from it. They said, we can't grow this crop. We don't want it. The Chinese give it to us. It's a conspiracy. It's going to do something for our soul. It's going to be like cut It's going to be everywhere. You know, and all this other stuff. And now we can't live without the soybean. But at that time in history, we were growing hemp. We were growing hemp that time in history and a lot of it. And history shows that we grow more of it before a war. Our production went up before World War I and went down after World War I went up, even though they tried to outlaw it in World War II, and the, the production still went up before World War II and then declined and went totally out of business after that because during World War II, they perfected nylon rope. We didn't need hemp rope anymore. So there was a lot of industry. You know, Henry Ford built a car in 1941, and it was made from hemp, sisal, and wheat straw. And, you, and if the farmer had been in the automobile industry then, he would have worked. The car that Henry Ford made, mysteriously burnt in Dearborn, Michigan. Twelve years later, helped come the 1953 Corvette made from fiberglass. Who grew that? So the thing that is, check the history on some of this stuff and it will give you a direction to go. And so composites, cellulose, things like that are the way to go. Get your roll bales, squire bales, whatever the industry decides to go and move forward with a cellulose industry, something in that fashion and I think when you look at cellulose, you're looking at cafeteria trays. You're looking at molded chairs. It's endless. It's endless. It goes on forever. So you say, where is our markets? You're setting in it. <laughs> you're setting in it. You're setting on it. So open your mind because this is a mind-opening experience. And the people that's in here, uh, it, I can see that there's a lot of interest. And uh, I'm proud to say that I was standing here this morning talking to uh, Representative Wright, and uh, a gentleman walked up to me that's sitting in the back. His name is Marion Haskins. He's from where I live, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it, brother, you know. And his family's all been about basketball, you know. And it, my, I went to Campbellsville High School, and he went to Taylor County. He lives here in Virginia. He said 10 minutes down the road. And so these are the people here that, that really fires me up, you know, to see it going. And, you know, I hope I, I hope I'm giving you some kind of light, but you need to have a good, strong organization to be able to get funding forward and to be able to move this away. And if, like you said, sir, traveling, one of the best places to travel on the hemp industry, and I was explaining this yesterday to Dr. Wilkerson, and that is the Europeans. The European Industrial Hemp Association is a place where you get a lot of answers. And what I was explaining to her is vertically, vertically integrate their business 
because Europe is, is uh, they don't have the amount of land we do to grow thousands of acres. So if you had the opportunity to go talk to these people, vertically integrate their business by coming to America and bringing their seed varieties, because seed, without it, we're done. We're finished. Ain't no need talking. If we don't have corn seed, we're done. So if you can bring those seed over here and get them acclimated to this region and be able by law to be able to grow them over and over so they can be acclimated and then ship the stuff back to Europe by the track by the freight load for their business or bring their business in. And this is where a strong cooperative, a group of people can go and do this and sit down and talk to these people who has the seed, who has the technology, and be able to show them that you want to develop a bio-based industry in this state. You know, North Carolina is moving forward on biodiesel. You know, and biodiesel, this is a little trick. All your oils will gel in the refrigerator. Each and every one of them. Western oil, canola oil, all of them. Olive oil, every one of them will gel. Put your hemp oil, just buy you a little bottle of it, put it over in the freezer, and call me if it freezes. Please do. Because I tried, I tried to get it frozen. I put it in deep freeze. I turned it down. You know, I freezer burnt, roast, trying to get it to freeze. And it wouldn't freeze. And so it'll freeze at 40 below zero. But nobody knows the jelling point. And the problem with biodiesel is the jelling point and this reclaimed oil is the oil that they used it and it put a black eye on the biofuels industry as far as using McDonald's oil and then those oils like that. So if we could grow hemp for biodiesel and set up an uh, organization for buses and using that, that's a market right here. And an oil press to be able to do this is uh, inexpensive, but getting the seed to fill the press. So these are just many markets. This is what we research. This is our job. We have Ken X Limited that was in Canada, seven hours we were at, they was opening markets. They give us, we had automobile parts that they was involved in. We had all kinds of plastics, everything. And that was my job, is to put on these shows around the state of Kentucky. And we made four Farm Bureau meetings, American Farm Bureau meetings. We did five of them, I made four. And uh, probably some of you uh, older people that went to some of these National Farm Bureau meetings, American Farm Bureau Federation meetings, uh, 20, 30,000 people, some of them, 15,000. Uh, we, we educated a lot of people. And that's what we did because we knew the education process is still going on today. And so if anybody's got any questions or anything like that, I'd be glad to answer them if it's room for it, uh, Dr. Mercy or anything like that. But, uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Clinton. Uh, from a farmer's standpoint, uh, how many acres would he have to grow create tree? To make it profitable, and what's the cost for acre to grow hemp, and what can they expect to get? From? Well, you know, the thing that is, I think cost per acre, that's going to be determined by what kind of seed you get with from Europe. You know, I'd say that right now, I think some of the seed is five, five dollars a pound or something like that. But what he's going to get per acre is what he's going to be growing it for. If he's going to be growing it for stock or for uh, for cellulose uh, base, then that's going to be the industry standards. And if you grow it for cellulose and you eliminate the middleman where you can actually take it to the the factory to get it uh, to get it uh, manufactured and whatever you're going to, then he's cut out a lot of middleman. So the price of the of, of what it is can be established through a cooperative. And, and this cooperative, that's what it's there for. And so more people that gets involved in a cooperative and a way to move it. A lot of people's against cooperatives. But if you go to Europe, they love cooperatives. So as a cooperative, you go to Europe, you come back over here. So the, the, at what you asked for a price, I had a farmer the other day. He said, if I got in, how much money would I make? I just stood there and looked at him. I said, nothing. You know why? Because you're not ready yet to get a price. The continuity supply hasn't been set up yet. So the thing about it is, everybody's looking for low-hanging fruit. The thing about it is, Adam and Eve found low-hanging fruit. Look where we're at today. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, uh, that's, that, that's what I'm at. And I know some people down in North Carolina that went after the low-hanging fruit and they're up to here in mud, you know. 
So it all depends on how you look at it. But my honest question about it is, or my honest answer is, right now, as far as making something tomorrow for the farmer, there's nothing in it unless you're involved in CBD oils, you know, for supplements and stuff like that. But there's nobody, and Colorado's been involved in this for a long time, talking about CBDs and CBD extracts and there's nobody jumping up shaking their palm palms telling me they made a hundred thousand dollars you know I had one gentleman call me up he's 88 years old and he said I he said I, I found some seed that the guy told me that I make a million dollars an acre on him and I said what he said for, for that extract he didn't know anything about it. he's 88 years old and I looked at him I said the only reason why you want to get involved in this because you don't have nothing else to do you know at 88 he's Kick back, he's thinking, see? And so I, if you, I told him, I said, if you're going to make a million dollars, I said, I need to get the bed with you. you know? I said, I'm all for this. So uh, honestly, you know, talking to the farmers is going out here and let the farmers rest. Let them rest because they can grow this crop. Virginia State University is doing the research to be able to see what varieties will work for the farmer. And if Virginia State University works with groups and organizations to go out here and find the, find the industry, they can say, hey, yes, we're interested in this, then we can get a price for the farm. And I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. Our project, $5 a pound, and we have about 100 acres of That's how much it costs, and that's not for a library. Yeah. We, we had a high cost program. Follow the rules. <coughs> How many times per acre? Up to 50, 60. Yeah. Let's see. Down to 10. There's a lot to know. Is there? Is there? Uh, but yeah, you're doing up to 50 or 60 pounds per acre, right? If you're doing a fiber crop. Oh, yeah, see? Yeah, if you're going to do a fiber, well, uh, fiber crop, roughly about 60 pounds. Of, I recommend 60 pounds of the acre across the board. Sure. 60 pounds. And they, in Kentucky, uh, Dr. David Williams, UK, we had a discussion about it. And I said, Dr. 60 pounds. He said, well, we're going to do 28. But if you do 60, you know, you're going to have a death. There's going to be something died. And the plants are more, they are more suited for 60 pounds of the acre because they'll grow straight up and they become more of a shade crop, per se. And uh, you're going to have some death there, but for for uh, for fiber crop down North Carolina, I walked into one and they can harvest it in 45 days with the uh, with the with the seed variety they use. And I looked at it, and the stalk was about as big as my little finger. And I looked across there and I said, "This makes good cellulose." And so from that meeting, from that standing in that field, there's a gentleman that left there that had the knowledge because they cooperative. He seen it with his own eyes that this cooperative was a real cooperative. So what he did, and we talked to him on his phone, going, he picked me up in, in Kentucky, and we drove down to North Carolina. We stayed for five days traveling around and talking to the people that was involved. And there's people involved in there in, in, uh, in, in biofuels, and they seen the fact that they could do this for cellulose, for the recycled cardboard industry. Cut it down, take it to a pulper. They've got a pulper up in southern Wisconsin and pulp it in to recycle cardboard. This is money in the bank in the morning. There is a market for that in the morning because they're cutting down trees of good, good cellulose to put into recycled cardboard to strengthen. And years ago, up in Kentucky, Nasal, Kentucky, there was a company up there called Inland Container they was a subsidiary of International Paper. They was making cardboard, and one of the representatives from the task force went up there and took some product. They told her there, at that time, that was in 95 or 96, they could use 6,000 acres of hemp to feed that meal right there. Recycled cardboard. With e-commerce e the way it is, you're not seeing any more Sears and Roebuck catalogs. In Los Angeles in a recycled center about two, three weeks ago, I saw I seen it in the news. They had nothing but a pile of nothing but paper there. And the gentleman standing there that was doing the interview that, over the recycle, he said, zoom the camera in. He said, on this peak, he zoomed it in, and there was very little newsprint. Very little. 
He said, we went from 40 to 50% paper up to 60 to 70% now cardboard. He said, in five years, you won't see the newsprint in here because of Amazon and e-commerce. So the industry that's cutting down the trees, you implement hemp, which can be grown every 30 to 45 days with that seed variety, save those trees. If you believe in carbon credits, they can save those trees. And for the industry, develop carbon credits. Yeah, G.I. Uh, Craig Lee, just tell these uh, politicians that what we talked about yesterday with uh, Dr. Wilson about until we get these seeds acclimated. Yeah. And if we can't keep the seeds and replant them and have to re-get them every year, we just waste the money. The, 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 what GO say is there's a, it's an international seed deal. And the seed that we get from Europe, we can't, we've got to destroy it. Dr. Wilkinson's got to destroy that. So her hands is tied as a plant breeder to be able to acclimate seed for this region. And so these are the problems that you find out that's in the industry because if you owned the seed variety, you would want to make sure that your seed variety was protected. And so that's what this law is all about, is protected. And so I think one of the things is, uh, you said you was a world traveler, and like to do different things, is go to the Europeans and sit down and try to get their uh, seed varieties here. And then while at the same time cleaning the air up through politics, to do, to do it, you know, Mitch McConnell, he's on board with this, and there's three other Republican candidates in Kentucky. One of Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, and Jamie Comer, who's a former commissioner. And these people right here are all about him. Please use them. Please use them. You know, this may be the last time Mitch McConnell runs for office. If we lose him as a minority, I mean, regardless of the politics, if we lose him as an advocate for him, we've all lost something. It doesn't matter if you're from California or New Mexico or whatever state that's trying to do this, you've lost something. So use Mitch McConnell up and try to get some of these laws changed, as Gio said, about the uh, about the seed and the and, and growing the seed for the industry because we need it. You know, I went I went as far as in our bill, Senate Bill fifty I had Kentucky Heritage hemp seed put into the bill. And everybody said, where did this come from? And they didn't know that I had it put in there. Commissioner Comer didn't know I had it put in there. Because we were down to the wire, and I had I asked for my blessings to go and talk to the uh, chief of staff that was the majority floor leader for the House, and I knew him. And so what I was working on is green coat. We took switch grass, which makes me mad, makes me really disturbed that we dump millions of dollars into switch grass. And I'm just a layman. At 35% cellulose, this won't work. I ain't got a PhD. I probably graduated high school. You know, I mean, I'm being honest. And I'm sitting here and I'm saying, well, switch grass won't work. But there's money being dumped in it. And I said, why not hemp when it's 85% cellulose? And it will blend with color. And there is a white paper that's being written on my behalf and several other people's behalf to show that hemp blended with coal works. They just need to do more study on it. So this is a big, big, big industry. And if you get big industries like this involved, then it makes it easier for everybody else. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, sorry. sorry, it's over. <laughs> yeah. Hey, appreciate every each and every one of you and thank you very much.